Hello, this is shear force and bending moment diagram example number two. So the objective of this example is to draw the shear force and the bending moment diagram for this beam. It's a simply supported beam with a cantilever uh, uh, segment AB. It's subjected to three point loads at uh, A, C, and D. So let me go ahead and shift over to OneNote and we'll start our work here. And the, uh, the first thing that uh, I'll uh, do is solve for the reactions, uh, but for the sake of this example, we'll assume that you guys can do that and you can solve for the reaction forces. Uh, we have a reaction force of 130 kips here at B and a reaction force of 50 kips out here at E. Okay, the next thing that I'll do is I'll refer to the uh, rules that we have for drawing shear force and bending moment diagrams. The first rule that we have is that we always work from left to right. We never work from right to left, we always work from left to right. The second rule that we have is that we always work from left to right. We never work from right to left, we always work from left to right. You'd be amazed at how many people try and apply this uh, set of rules and uh, work from right to left and they just don't work when you work from right to left. So um, what we're going to do is start off the end of the, uh, the beam from the left, and then we'll work our way from point A all the way over to uh, point E, and then just off the, uh, the edge of the beam to the right. The first thing that I'll do, though, is I'll sketch in some construction lines. Uh, I'll draw those in here as uh, green lines so that, uh, well, that's not green, is it? So that we can have uh, a bit of uh, accuracy uh, when we go in and uh, sketch our shear force and bending moment diagrams. Okay, just like that. Now, if I were working on paper and pencil, then I would just uh, have a, a very uh, uh, light uh, pencil line there so that you can erase it or just uh, leave it then afterwards. All right, so we're going to start off the left end of the beam. And uh, what we're going to say is that the shear force just to the left of point A is equal to zero. So I'll say the shear force at point A to minus, that means just to the left of point A is uh, equal to zero. And that comes from uh, rule number three, the shear force at a free end is equal to zero. Now, if we go to uh, uh, the next thing is to say that the shear force just to the right of point A, VA plus is equal to the shear force just to the left of uh, point A, plus the change in shear that we have at point A. So the, uh, the next rule that we have is that um, uh, rule number seven says the concentrated force on a beam will result in an instantaneous change in shear that is equal to the magnitude of the applied shear force. So um, if we have a, uh, a shear force, uh, I'm sorry, a, a concentrated load of 30 kips uh, acting right here, that means that, con that changes the, uh, the uh, shear force diagram by a magnitude of 30 kips. So we could say this is equal to the shear force just to the left of point A plus the change in shear is minus 30 kips. So that means that the shear force just to the right of point A is minus 30 kips. Let me scroll down just a little bit. There we go. So that means that uh, this is going to be minus 30 kips. So minus 30. I don't need to put the units in. They're already over there at the right edge of that. All right, so nothing happens between points A and B on the beam. There aren't any loads there, so nothing changes with respect to the shear force diagram. I could say that the shear force just to the left of point B is equal to uh, minus 30 kips because there was no change between points A and B. Now, I can say that the shear force just to the right of point B is equal to the shear force just to the left of point B plus the change in shear uh, that occurs at point B. So this is equal to a minus 30 kips. At point B, we have a load of 130 kips acting upwards. So we have a change in shear of 130 kips. So that means that the shear just to the right of point B is equal to 100 kips. So if that was 30, that makes 100 right about there. So I'll go ahead and sketch that line. So that is 100 kips. Don't need the units. Okay. Um, now, technically speaking, the shear uh, force in the beam at, underneath any one of these loads is undefined. So the shear force at point B is undefined. It could be anywhere between a, uh, a value of, whoops, 
It could be anywhere between a value of 100 or negative 30. We just don't know what it is. In reality, that force is going to be distributed over some finite length. It's going to be distributed over a bearing pad or something like that if it's a beam. And uh, the, there won't be an instantaneous change in shear. Instead, there'll be some uh, finite uh, change. There'll be some slope to this line. But we typically ignore that when we draw shear force in bending moment diagrams. Okay, nothing happens. There's no loads on the beam between points B and C. So nothing happens to the shear force diagram. All right, so... Um, we could go over here and uh, say that uh, the shear just to the left of point C is equal to 100 kips. Then we could say that the shear force just to the right of point C is equal to the shear force just to the left of point C plus the change in shear that occurs at point C. So this is equal to 100 kips. At point C there is a point load acting downwards. So that means that we have a change in shear equal to a minus 120 kips. So just to the right of point C, the shear force has a magnitude of minus 20. So that's there, minus 20, and that goes there. Then between points C and D, nothing happens on the beam, no applied loads. So we end up with no change in shear between those two points. All right, now when we uh, get to point D, we say that the shear force just to the left of point D is equal to a minus 20 kips. We say that the shear force just to the right of point D is equal to the shear force just to the left of point D plus the change in shear that occurs at point D. So that's equal to a minus 20 kips plus the change in shear. The change in shear is equal to a minus 30 put that in parentheses like that. So then the shear force just to the right of point D is equal to minus 50 kips. So that was minus 20, 30, 40, so 50 is going to be right about there. So that's minus 50. Okay, there aren't any loads applied to the beam between points D and E, so no change in shear. Then we can say that the shear force just to the left of point E is equal to minus 50 kips and we could say that the shear force just to the uh, right of point E is equal to the shear force just to the left of point E plus the change in shear that occurs at point E so this is equal to a minus 50 plus and then we have this force here at point E 50 kips and so that equals zero so our shear force diagram closes and we go back to zero like that. All right, so that completes the drawing of the shear force diagram. The um, uh, one thing to note is that the diagram always starts at zero at the left and always finishes at zero at the right. It has to close, in other words. If the shear force diagram doesn't close, then that means that you've either uh, made a mistake in drawing the shear force diagram or you have a mistake in the reactions that you solved on the beam. If the reactions are incorrect, then the shear force diagram won't close. All right. Okay, the next step for us is to draw the bending moment diagram. We need the shear force diagram in order to be able to sketch the bending moment diagram. So typically you would sketch the shear force diagram in its entirety and then go and sketch the bending moment diagram after that. So um, we're going to do the same thing that we did before. We're going to work from left to right to sketch the, shear, the bending moment diagram. And um, we'll go back and uh, take a look at the, uh, the rules that we have for shear force and bending moment diagrams. All right, so we're going to start off off the left end of the beam, and we're going to use um, rule number four. So the moment at the free end of a beam is always equal to the zero. So we say that the moment just to the left of point A is equal to zero by rule number four. Um, there aren't any concentrated moments on this beam. Uh, that's a different example problem. So we don't have to worry about an instantaneous change in moment occurring uh, for this example, but we do have uh, changes in moment due to the shear force. So we could say that the moment just to the left of point A is equal to zero, and the moment just to the right of point A is equal to zero as well. Now we will use rule number nine. We could say that the, uh, the moment at point B is equal to the moment that's at point A plus the change in moment between points A and B. Now, there's a 
change in moment there because the shear is not equal to zero. If we refer to rule number nine, it says that the change in shear between two points, A and B, is equal to uh, the area under the load diagram. That's actually not the rule I want. Hang on. Um, rule number 10, the change in moment between two points, A and B, is equal to the area under the shear diagram between those two points. So here we know that this is equal to zero, but in order to figure out what the uh, um, uh, change in moment between those two points is, we need to figure out what the area is under this shear force diagram. So we take that area there, and what that is, it's an area that has a magnitude of minus 30 kips times a distance of 8 feet. So we would end up with 240 kip feet. So that's equal to plus, okay, minus 30 kips acting over a distance of 8 feet. So then we end up with a net of minus 240 kip feet. So when we go over here, we could say that this is going to be the moment there. So then we would go ahead and connect those two with a straight line. Okay, this is uh, minus 240, or you could just write in 240 because you know that it's going to be negative because it's below the line. So if we were interested in doing so, we could say that the slope of this line is equal to the magnitude of the shear. So that's equal to a minus 30 because the magnitude of the shear is equal to the slope of the bending moment diagram. All right, we don't use that too often, but we do use it occasionally. Uh, I just wanted to point that out at this point. All right, so um, then we could go next and say that the moment at point C is equal to the moment that we had at point B plus the change in moment between points B and C. Again, I don't need to worry about the moment just to the left of point C or the moment just to the right of point C because there's no concentrated moments acting on this beam. So up here, I'm looking at this as the change in moment between points B and C. So this is delta MBC. That's that area right there is the change in moment between B and C. So this is equal to a minus 240 kip feet plus that's going to have a magnitude of 100 kips positive acting over a distance of 8 feet. So then the moment just uh, at point C is equal to minus 240 plus 800 or it's equal to a positive 560 kip feet. Okay, so then over here, one, two, three, four, five. All right, my scale is going to be a little bit off. I didn't scale this uh, very intelligently when I started. So like that, then this is 560 kip feet there. All right, we could keep going. The moment at point D is equal to the moment at point C plus the change in moment between C and D. So that's equal to 560 kip feet plus then up here we have this is the this area here is the change in moment between C and D. So that's equal to minus 20 kips acting over 8 feet. So we would end up with a final moment there at point D of 400 kip feet. So that would be about there. So that's 400. And then finally, we can come in and say that the moment at point E is equal to the moment at point D plus the change in moment between uh, D and E. So that's equal to 400 kip feet plus, and the change in moment is going to be this area. So that's the change in moment between points D and E. It's the area under that shear force diagram. So that's equal to a minus 50 kips acting over 8 feet. So we end up with 400 kip feet minus 400 kip feet is equal to 0 kip feet. And so the bending moment diagram comes down there and closes like so. So that is our bending moment diagram. Uh, it starts at, uh, it closes uh, both at the left end and the right end, so we have confidence that it's correct. If that didn't close, then we either have a 
an error in our bending moment diagram calculations, there would be an error in our shear force diagram, or there is an error in the equilibrium of the beam. The reactions don't work out. All right, as a last step, um, we often want to know um, where the inflection point is in uh, our bending moment diagram. So at this point right here, there is a change in moment. It goes from being negative to the left of that point to being positive to the right of that point. And knowing where that inflection point occurs is important when we do designs of beams. So what our next step will be is to solve for that inflection point. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to insert the dimension x in here. And let me do it, uh, I guess I'll, um, I'll do it in blue. So this is going to be the dimension x, and I'm going to measure it from point B over to the inflection point. And I'll put my dimension off like this. All right. Now, the way that we solve for that inflection point is we say that uh, the moment at the inflection point is going to be equal to the moment at point B. Okay, that's the moment at point B right there plus the change in moment between the point B and the inflection point. And we know that the moment at the inflection point is equal to zero. So what we can do then is we can go in and we could say that the moment at point B is minus 240 kip feet. Okay, we know that it comes from our bending moment diagram there. And we know that the change in moment is going to be equal to the area under the shear force diagram between point B and the inflection point. So the way that that works out is we come up here like this and let me sketch this in in green. So I'm just sketching a construction line here. So that means that the change in moment between point B and the inflection point is this distance right here. So that is going to be delta M B I P, the change in moment between point B and the inflection point. So that change in moment is going to be plus 100 kips. That's the magnitude of shear at this point right here, times this distance X. And we know that that is equal to zero. So all that we need to do at this point is solve for X. And if we do our math correctly, we would see that X is equal to 2.40 feet. So we could say that this inflection point here is at a distance of 2.4 feet from point B. All right, now if we look at the uh, uh, shear force and bending moment diagram drawn a little bit more neatly, then this is what it would look like uh, you know, incomplete. There we go. So I can be a little bit more neat when uh, I'm not constrained by the size of the, uh, the screen. All right, so I hope this helps.